online fellowship here tonight, okay? I'm so fortunate to be able to meet each and every single one of you. So I'm going to go ahead and say hello to the brothers and sisters that are here. Um, in my group, we have Brother Carl. We've got Richie, Sister Sheila, Sister Maria. Uh, hello, Sister Victoria, Gina, Marilyn, Chloe, and uh, Annunciata, Cedric, Robin, Jackie, Ty, Nancy, Monroe, Maddie. We also have Hiata. Hi, Sister Hiata. Aniston, Monica, Mary, we have Gail, Lynette, Kathy, Louise, Michelle. We also have Nora, Elizabeth, and Sister uh, Catherine's group. We have Nora, we've got Elizabeth, we've got Anna, David, Nancy, Kenneth, Valerie. Uh, we also have John, Anthony, uh, Tammy, Paulette, Michelia, Kathy, Rodrikas, Skeeter, and Carola. Hello, brothers and sisters. So nice to meet each and every single one of you. Um, it's wonderful that we can all devote our time right now to Christ and his words, you know, to true worship to God. You know, it's so important that every day we take time to be able to seek the truth. And I do believe that all of us here are God's sheep. And I pray that uh, joining our online fellowship will give us a better insight and also an understanding about the Lord's second coming, right? So, brothers and sisters, before we begin, I'm just going to give us another wonderful reminder of muting the mics, okay? So, because there is a lot of brothers and sisters who are here with us tonight, uh, just please make sure that you are muting your mic so that everyone else has an equal opportunity to be able to listen to the fellowship without any interruptions, all right? Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So, brothers and sisters, uh, if you also have any questions, you can type your questions down into the group chat, as well as uh, we will be asking questions as we go along. So feel free to uh, answer and check the group chat at all times, because that's where we will be sharing. Uh, that's where we'll be sharing um, passages of God's words, also questions and any of your inquiries. OK, brothers and sisters. So before we begin, um, I truly do believe it's important for us to do an opening prayer. So let's go ahead and uh, let's pray. All right, let's pray so that God may lead and guide our fellowship here for tonight, all right? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, dear God, once again, we thank you so much for waking us up this morning and um, giving us the opportunity to open up our eyes and um, be here with uh, many devout believers from all over the world who are seeking for your return and wanting to understand the amazing work that you will do in the last days, dear God. Tonight, we're going to talk about why you need to come back in the flesh and uh, what is the importance of your work as the Son of Man, dear God. Uh, we know that we are living in a corrupted world such as today, filled with evil, dear Lord, uh, where people no longer know what the truth is anymore. But um, because you will return, dear God. We will continue to bring us more truth. And I just pray that each and every single one of us can have the opportunity to welcome you truly, dear God. And um, I just pray for all of the brothers and sisters here. May each and every single one of our hearts be quiet before you. May you also lead and guide our fellowship here for tonight and uh, enlighten us with your truth, dear God. Um, and we leave this uh, prayer into your mighty hands. May the honor and glory always be with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right. All right. So my beloved brothers and sisters, I know you guys yesterday spoke about the, the two ways of the Lord's return. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to do a quick review based on last night's topic. Just, you know, wanting to see whether brothers and sisters uh, understood yesterday's um, fellowship. OK, so let's have a look at the question that I will send to the group chat. And I want you to give me your best answer, all right? So my question to you guys is, when the Lord Jesus said many times he will come back as the son of man and like a thief, what does it mean? Is it option A? Jesus will come back as a normal human flesh on the earth again. Is it B? Jesus will come back in spirit, which we can't touch or see. Or C, I'm not so sure, brothers and sisters. What is the correct answer in which when the Lord says he comes back as the son of man, what did he mean? All right. Amen. Sister Hiata says, A, he will come back in the flesh. Sister Chloe says, A. Also, Sister Sheila, Sister Victoria, Sister Maria says, A. Amen. Sister Jackie says, A. 
Um, amen. Brother Carl says, yep, he should come back as, as the son of man. Amen, Brother Carl. Brother Peter also says A. And then we have Sister Rosa, Sister Nancy, Sister Elizabeth, uh, Rodrecus, that also says A. Paulette says A. Taylor, Louise says A. Amen, brothers and sisters. Very good sharing. Very good understanding. You're absolutely correct. All right. Yes, you are absolutely correct, my dear brothers and sisters. The Lord does come as the Son of Man, which actually refers to God coming back in the flesh. Okay, so let me send a quick picture into the group chat so that you may see what what Son of Man actually refers to. So by looking at this picture here, brothers and sisters, we can see that Son of Man actually refers to one refers to one who was born to man, right? So someone who was born to man obviously is of the flesh, right? So the Lord's second coming, yes, it shall be as the son of man. All right, so very good sharing, brothers and sisters, very good sharing. And I'm gonna ask you a second question. All right, second question. You guys are on a roll already, having all the correct answers. So my second question is, in which way will God return? All right. In which way will God return? Is it A, God will return publicly because coming on, on the cloud, or B, God will secretly arrive in spirit, or C, first he will come in secret in a normal flesh, then he will appear on the clouds in public, or D, I'm not so sure. So who remembers the answer to this question? Ah, oh, Angie, Angie, good sharing. Very quick, Sister Angie. Angie says C. Victoria also says C. Sheila, Hiata, Maria say C. We also have Elizabeth says C. Um, Anna, Nancy, Rose, Tammy, Kathy, Rodriguez, Charlotte, Paulette, Jemima, Jaguar, Temple Phyllis, Amen, brothers and sisters, sister Jackie, brother Ty, also all said C. So very good understanding and very good sharing. And Jack Dish also said C. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters, you're absolutely correct. So let's have a look at some prophecies, okay? Let's look at some prophecies of the Lord's um, secret arrival before the Great Tribulation and also the public arrival after the Great Tribulation, okay? So let's have a look here quickly, brothers and sisters. Yes, there are prophecies of the Lord's return due to the secret um, coming, which is as the Son of Man, uh, and it refers to him coming back in the flesh as the Son of Man before the Great Tribulation, where we have here Revelation 3.3, 3, where it mentions, If therefore you shall not watch, I will come on you as a thief, and you shall not know what hour I will come on you. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, will sup with him, and he with me. And we also have Luke 17.24-25, where it says, For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. So all of these prophecies are entailing the Lord's return before the Great Tribulation, brothers and sisters. He actually comes back as a thief, as the Son of Man. And the most important thing that we need to do is what? Focus on the truth. Focus on the words that he speaks, right? Um, it also mentions that he will suffer many things and be rejected by our generation. So we, we can understand, right? God coming back in the spirit, he can't really suffer or be rejected. Only when God becomes flesh can he be said to suffer many things and be rejected by our generation. So that's the secret arrival. And then we have here the public arrival after the Great Tribulation. And this is a Bible verse that all of us are very aware of. Revelation 1-7. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Amen. So we can see here, brothers and sisters, in this public appearance, that will be when the Lord appears on the cloud, which will not be the Son of Man. It will not be the flesh. It will actually be the spiritual body appearing on the cloud to reward the good and punish the evil. All right. So I do have a picture here that I do want to send to my beloved brothers and sisters. But before I do send this photo, we're going to listen to a quick video. All right. We're going to listen to a quick video of the Lord's um, of 
how, what are the different ways of the Lord's return? So give me one second and I'm going to play it. And brothers and sisters, let me know if you can hear it. Okay, here we go. But how
Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. Thanks be to God. So after listening to um, this audio over here, I'm going to send a picture into the group chat, okay? So we can see it in a different perspective of God's appearance to humanity. So we're going to take it back to history, right? The Lord Jesus' first coming, um, God became an ordinary person to proclaim the truth and carry out the work of redemption, right? And then God appeared in a spiritual body to humans, but it was too late to believe. And we all remember doubting Thomas, right? Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who do not see and yet can still believe. So God actually wants us to accept his coming, not when you see the spiritual body, but most importantly, when you can accept the truth spoken by the Son of Man, when God is on earth in the flesh. So the second coming of the Lord's return, brothers and sisters, God also becomes an ordinary person. That's what the Son of Man refers to, right? And once again, it's to proclaim the truth to perform the work of judgment, which is a purification, which we will talk about it very, very soon. And then God will appear in the spiritual body coming on the clouds. And once again, it's too late to believe. So as all of us here tonight, we all chose the correct answer, which was C. First, he will come in the flesh as a normal person. Then he will appear on the cloud in public. And this is all based on prophecies. All right, brothers and sisters, this is all based on prophecies. And this is why we're going to talk tonight of why, right? Why? My question that we're going to talk about tonight is why does God choose to return in the flesh again? Why does he come back as the son of man again, instead of directly bringing us into the kingdom of heaven? And brothers and sisters, I really do pray that um, you can give us our your undivided attention because tonight's topic, it is very, very important for us to understand why come back in the flesh again, right? What is the significance of God coming back in the flesh? Because a lot of people, you know, they think that the Lord Jesus already redeemed mankind. So people think that just because we have already been redeemed, that God is just going to rapture us directly into the kingdom when he comes. But brothers and sisters, people have this notion, this imagination, because they think that believing in Jesus, yeah, your sins are forgiven, that God will take you into the kingdom of heaven directly. But is that really the case? Is this idea of being redeemed and forgiven of our sins mean that we can enter the kingdom of heaven directly? Is this supported in the word of God? Did the Lord Jesus ever say that our sins being forgiven is all we need to enter the kingdom of heaven? What do you think, brothers and sisters? I don't think so, right? He never did say that. The Lord Jesus never said, all you have to do is be forgiven and you can enter the kingdom of heaven. And the Holy Spirit absolutely bore no witness to this as well. So we can be certain that this idea is purely human notion, human imaginings, because having our sins forgiven does not mean that we can enter the kingdom of heaven, okay, brothers and sisters. So we cannot rely on that to enter the kingdom of heaven, which actually brings me into another question, because we need to understand who who is he, who is the person that sets the standard for entering the kingdom of heaven? What do you think? Who sets the standard for us to enter the kingdom of heaven? Do you think it's A, God? Do you think it's B, the disciples and the apostles? Or do you think it's C, the angels? Or do you think it's uh, D, us, the believers? What do you think, brothers and sisters? Who sets the standard for entering the kingdom of heaven? Hmm. What do you think, brothers and sisters? Who sets the standard for those who can enter the kingdom of heaven? Let's see what brothers and sisters are saying. All right, let me check the answers. All right, so here we say, Sister Taylor says, actually, it's A, it's God. Jackie says it's God. Ty says it's God. Victoria says it's God. Amen. Uh, Sheila says it's God. Uh, Ted says it's God. Brother Carl says judgment because the work of judgment is God's expression of the truth and expression of his righteous disposition to conquer, purify, and to save mankind. Amen. Amen, brother. Anyone else, brothers and sisters, who sets the standard of who can enter the kingdom of heaven? 
Uh, we have more brothers and sisters, Sister Anna, Rose, Nancy, Elizabeth, Abby, uh, Louise, Sarah, Tammy, Sandy, Jeffrey. They all said it is God. And I absolutely agree. All right. I do see someone that said it is the believers, but actually it is not the believers at all. It is God himself. He is the one who sets the standard for entering the kingdom of heaven. Because guess what? The kingdom of heaven belongs to God, right? It's just like who sets the standard for those who can enter into our home? It is you. You're the one who sets the standard for people who can enter your home or not, right? So it's the same thing for God, brothers and sisters. God also sets the standard of those who can enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. So now we're going to understand what are the requirements then, right? If it is God who sets the standard for those who can enter the kingdom of heaven, then what is God's requirement for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven? So let me go ahead and send some Bible verses into the group chat. And brothers and sisters, I would love if a brother or sister can volunteer to read for us tonight. Would anyone like to read, brothers and sisters? Would anyone like to uh, volunteer to open up their mics and read uh, what are the requirements to enter God's kingdom and who can enter God's kingdom? Okay, Sister Sheila, go right ahead, dear sister. Whenever you're ready, you can open up your mic and you can read for us here tonight. Sister Sheila, we can't, we can't, Sister Sheila, your microphone is still muted, sister. You'll have to open up your mic. In order to oh, perfect. Right now we can hear you. Amen. Very good reading, Sister Sheila. Thank you so much. Very good reading, Sister. So yes, brothers and sisters, after Sister Sheila just finished beautifully reading this, uh, these Bible verses here for us, well, let's go back to the question, right? What are the requirements to enter God's kingdom and who can enter God's kingdom? Did you get the answer from these Bible verses here, brothers and sisters? What, what is the requirement to enter God's kingdom? Well, when we read these uh, Bible verses, we can pick out a few points, right? One, we have to obey God and we have to live out the words of God. Number two, we need to be holy and we need to be purified, just like Brother Carl shared earlier. And number three, we need to stop sinning and we need to live free from sin, brothers and sisters, right? So from this, we can understand that being forgiven 
being forgiven of our sin, it does not mean that we have stopped sinning. It does not mean that we can truly obey God in all things. It doesn't mean that we can practice his words, let alone that we are already holy and qualified to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's not the case. Because, brothers and sisters, all believers in the Lord can see the fact that although we are redeemed, yes, that's true, we're constantly sinning. We're living in a cycle of sinning by the day, confessing by the night, right? We're unable to escape sin. People are jealous. People pursue fame and status. People start to believe in God and follow Jesus because of the grace and the blessing that God gives out. But we can't really live out his words. Even today, a lot of people, they rush to church when they're faced with difficulties and trials. But in times of peace, we follow worldly trends, right? Also today, churches is hosting one party after another. No one really fellowships on the truth. Instead, people just compete with each other. Who receives the most grace? Who has the greater blessings? But as we can see, disasters is already here, brothers and sisters. But yet we can see the Lord has not come on the cloud yet. So a lot of people's faith are fading, right? People are starting to blame God, to judge God. People have even denied and betrayed God. So let's consider something, brothers and sisters. All right, let's consider this simple question that I really want you to ponder and uh, reflect on, okay? And my question is, if God... Because remember, we all have this idea that as long as we are forgiven of our sins, we can enter the kingdom of heaven. But remember, we're still living in a cycle of sinning and confessing. So let's consider this question. If God, if God were to bring us who frequently sin and resist him into his kingdom, what kind of situation would that be? And how different would it be from this world, brothers and sisters? What do you think? If God were just to bring us into the kingdom of heaven of how we are right now, still sinning, still resisting him into his kingdom of heaven, how different would it be from the world? When you really think about it, it wouldn't be considered God's kingdom anymore, right? It would actually be blasphemy to God. So considering the fact, the viewpoint that we hold so dearly to our hearts, that being forgiven of our sins can automatically grant us entry into the kingdom of heaven, it actually contradicts the Lord's teaching. So this idea is really telling people that, hey, go ahead, you can sin, go ahead, resist God. You're still going to enter into the kingdom of heaven because you're forgiven. But brothers and sisters, when you really think about it, exactly, uh, Sister Angie, there's no difference, right? Amen, Sister Shirley. It's no different from living in this world today. There's no pursuit of breaking free from sin or even striving to obey and worship God. You're actually allowing your sin to spread. So the pers- this perspective it really leads people down the path of resistance against God. And judging by the outcome it produces, the viewpoint definitely does not originate from God. Okay, brothers and sisters, being forgiven of our sins can grant us into the kingdom of heaven does not originate from God. It is driven by our selfish desires, our personal imaginings, and it's likely influenced by Satan. All right, brothers and sisters, and this is something that we always need to question all the time because many people don't question, right? Because a lot of people consider this to be the foundation of their faith. So after reading these uh, Bible verses over here, we can understand and we can see the fact and understand that why the Lord Jesus said those who preached out and those who cast out devils in his name, he says they're evildoers. He's like, I never knew you depart from me. It's because people are always still sinning. Right. And even though we're forgiven of our sins, people still blame and judge God. People are full of complaints when they see the Lord has not come. Right. People begin to deny and betray him. Some people have even people even say, well, I'll have a word with God if he doesn't rapture me. You see, brothers and sisters, we make demands of God. We make demands of God. So we can see here, my beloved brothers and sisters, that it kind of reminds me of the Pharisees. Right. The Pharisees who oppressed and condemned the Lord Jesus. And uh, some people are even worse than the Pharisees. In God's eyes, people see these people as evildoers. God is holy. God is also righteous. And he would never allow those who are constantly sinning and judging and resisting him into his kingdom. All right. So people's belief that being justified by faith will definitely get us into the kingdom of heaven is actually nothing but a notion that goes against the Lord's own teaching. It's actually it's human notion and imaginings. And it comes from our extravagant desires. All right. And it reminds me of this picture over here, brothers and sisters. I'm going to send you guys a picture. All right. 
I'm going to send you guys a picture. So this is basically us in this picture. We are carrying baggage with us, right? Because we all think we can enter the kingdom of heaven how we are right now. But God said, nope, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Yes, you're forgiven, but I have not purified you. I have not cleansed you yet because you still have arrogance in you, envy, jealousy, hate, greediness, lust, vanity, pride, hypocrisy, brothers and sisters, the list goes on, right? We still harbor all of these things. So the kingdom of heaven is closed. It's closed to such people who still harbor all of these natures, these sinful natures, all right? So a lot of you may be thinking, well, yes, I'm forgiven, but how can I enter the kingdom of heaven? If we can't enter the kingdom of heaven this way, then what does it mean to be saved? This is very important, brothers and sisters, on what it means to be saved, all right? So we're going to read two short spiritual passages here together. And I do have an audio for this one, brothers and sisters. So I'm going to play the audio for these two spiritual, uh, spiritual words that we can understand what does it actually mean to be saved, right? Which is very important because if we can't enter the kingdom of heaven just by having our sins forgiven, then how can we? Let's listen carefully. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So let's try to understand what it actually means to be saved, right? Because a lot of brothers and sisters, they think that once you're saved, you're always saved. But that's not the case. Because well, first, we need to understand why the Lord Jesus became the sin offering, right? So from this, we can see the Lord Jesus, yes, he was crucified for man's, uh, for man's um, redemption, right? He redeemed all of us from sin. So Basically, each and every single one of us, all, what do we have to do? We have to confess and we have to repent to the Lord Jesus to have our sins forgiven. And we're no longer condemned or put to death under the law, right? So a lot of brothers and sisters may not know this, but we're going to talk a little bit about history, all right? So brothers and sisters, in the Old Testament, right? Because in each stage of God's work, God has requirements for us and his requirements get bigger and bigger. So, for example, in the Old Testament, if you wanted to be saved from sin, what did you have to do? I don't know if you guys know this, but you needed to have a sacrifice, right, for going against the laws and commandments, such as a burnt offering like a baby sheep or a baby cattle, right? And I'm going to send you guys a picture so that you may see what was happening back in the Old Testament. So you had to give a sin offering in the tabernacle for your sins to be forgiven, Right. And if you did not have a sacrifice for your sins back in the Old Testament, well, guess what, brothers and sisters, you would actually be stoned to death. And I'm going to send you pictures of what was happening when you commit a sin back in the Old Testament. Oh, yeah, it was a little bit different. Right. It was a little bit different. My beloved brothers and sisters, uh, they were stoned to death for committing way too many sins. And this is exactly what was happening back in the Old Testament. So but. When Jesus came into the world of men, the requirements were a little bit different. No longer were you required a burnt offering to have your sins forgiven um, because by the New Testament, 
God became flesh as the Lord Jesus, and he was crucified as man's sin offering, redeeming all of mankind from sin. So basically today, we don't have to offer a sacrifice to have our sins forgiven, right? We don't have, we don't need a burnt offering because as long as we confess, as long as we repent before the Lord, our sins are forgiven. We're no longer condemned or put to death under the law of the Old Testament because we sin. So without being saved by the Lord Jesus, brothers and sisters, we would all be dead by now. If we were not redeemed by the Lord Jesus, none of us would be here today. Because remember, brothers and sisters, in the book of Romans, it clearly says, for the wage of sin is death, right? So because of our faith, the Lord Jesus no longer sees us as sinners and Satan can no longer accuse us. We are actually allowed to come before God in prayer. We're able to enjoy the peace and the joy that he bestows upon us alongside with his abundant grace and blessings. And this is what actually being saved means, okay? So being saved for faith, it only means being forgiven and not being sentenced to death because we sin. It's not like what people imagine, that once you're saved, you're always saved. No, 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 no. People today, they think, well, I'm saved. I'm, I'm saved by the blood of the lamb. I can enter the kingdom of heaven directly. No, we are only saved for not being condemned under the law, my beloved brothers and sisters. So basically put what the Lord Jesus did in the work of redemption. Yes, he did save us, but being saved, it means being saved for our faith only means that we are forgiven of our sins, that we are no longer condemned under the law, so we are saved from the condemnation of the law. That's what it means to be saved by the redemption work, okay? Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, are we clear so far? Are we clear so far in understanding what it meant to be saved back in the law? I mean, back in the Lord Jesus's work of redemption? Let me know if we're clear before we move on to the next point, okay? Okay. All right. Amen. What about other brothers and sisters? Are we clear so far? All right. Good stuff, brothers and sisters. Good stuff. So, yes, let's continue, right? So, yes, our sins are forgiven. Well, the most important thing now is how can we escape sin, right? Because I'm, I'm sure each and every single one of us are dying to understand, yes, our sins are forgiven, but how can we enter the kingdom of heaven, Tell Sister Talma? You told us we can't enter the kingdom of heaven just for being forgiven. Well, how can we escape sin? How can we become holy? And how can we gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven? Because let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, just accepting the Lord Jesus's forgiveness, it really isn't enough. You also have to welcome the Lord's second coming. You also have to accept the next step of work in order for you to escape sin, be fully saved by God, and thus be worthy of the kingdom of heaven. All right? So now let us understand, well, what is, the, what is the next step then, right? What is God's work in the last days? Let's have a look. Brothers and sisters, first and foremost, I want to ask you guys. I want to know whether you guys know what is the work God comes back to do. All right, I'm going to send you some Bible verses. And I need another volunteer to help me read these Bible verses. And then from these Bible verses, we will be able to see clearly uh, what is the work God comes back to do. All right. So brothers and sisters, would anyone like to volunteer to read these Bible verses here for us? Starting with Isaiah, uh, you can feel free to open up your mic and you can start reading if brothers and sisters want to read. OK. Any volunteers, Brother Carl? I know Sister Sheila already read. Hello. I see someone has their microphone open. Would you like to read? No? All right, maybe I can read this one, brothers and sisters. Let's have a look here. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 4, it says, He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. Psalm 76, 13, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. John 5, 27, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. First Peter 4, 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. 
John 10, 12, 48, he that rejects me and does not receive my words has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. Amen. Amen. So brothers and sisters, after reading these Bible verses, what work does God accomplish when he returns? Would you say A, the work of judgment? Would you say B, the work of redemption? Or would you say C, the work of forgiveness? What do you think, brothers and sisters? Pay attention to the prophecies. The answer is right in front of us. Amen, Ty. Good sharing. Amen, Sister Jessica. Amen, Sister Victoria. Anyone else want to share? What is the work God comes back to do? Amen, Sister Maria, Sister Sheila, good sharing. Anyone else, brothers and sisters, feel free to share. Don't be shy. Sister Nancy, Sister Kitty, Sister Hiata. Amen, Sister Taylor. Amen, Louise, good sharing. Amen, Sister Sophia. Amen, Brother Lawrence, good sharing. Good sharing, brother. Thanks be to God. That's right, brothers and sisters. Amen, Sister Julie, is it is in fact the work of judgment. And take a look, brothers and sisters, both works, well, the work of redemption and the work of judgment, it is done both by the Son of Man, God in the flesh. The work of redemption was done by the Son. The work of judgment is also done by the Son. Having a look here on John 5, 27, the Father gave authority to the Son to execute judgment. So both works are done by God in the flesh. You see, brothers and sisters, it is right there in front of us, right? So the Lord Jesus returns in the last days as the Son of Man. It is to express the truth, to do the work of judgment, guiding us to enter into all truth, because quite frankly, we don't all have the truth yet. So we also need to be free from our sin. We need to be free from Satan's forces. We need to achieve complete salvation. So accepting God's work of judgment in the last days and having our corruptions cleansed really is the only path into the kingdom of heaven. All right. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. So let's continue reading some spiritual words here tonight, okay, to understand why do we need the judgment, right? Why? So let's listen carefully. I do have an audio for this one, and I want us to listen carefully to understand why, why do we still need it, right? We already forgiven. Why do we still need it? Let's listen carefully. It will not be able to save man from sin. Only half the work of salvation has been completed. For man still has a corrupt disposition. It is not easy for man to become aware of his sins. 
he has no way of recognizing his own deeply rooted nature. And he must rely on judgment by the word in order to achieve this result. Only thus can man gradually be changed from this point onward. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Thanks be to God. So after reading these spiritual words here, we're going to focus on this question of, yes, the Lord Jesus redeemed us 2,000 years ago. So why does he return for the work of judgment in the last days, right? Well, first and foremost, brothers and sisters, yes, we need to understand that we are constantly living in a cycle of sinning and confessing each and every single day, even though we have been forgiven. So 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus only finished the work of redemption, right? He only completed half of God's work of salvation, brothers and sisters, because the judgment is the other half. So going back to the re redemption work, yes, we are qualified to pray before God. We're qualified to fellowship with the Lord. We're even able to enjoy the grace and the blessings that he gives us. Yes, our sins are forgiven. And uh, we can enjoy the peace that is given by the Holy Spirit, but we're still sinning all the time. We're stuck in this cycle of sinning, confessing, sinning, confessing again and again, right? No one can escape the constraints of sin. We struggle with it. It's painful. There's no way to be free from it. So this shows us that though the Lord forgave us for our sins, well, the sinful nature, the corrupt disposition, it still exists in us, brothers and sisters, all right? Because, because of the sinful nature, we're likely to rebel against God again, resist and judge God at any moment. And this is an undeniable fact that none of us can deny. So no matter how long someone has been a believer, you can't escape sin. You can't achieve holiness or be worthy of facing God. So talking about the sinful nature, brothers and sisters, well, what do we need to do? What do we need to do, right? Well, let's have a look here, brothers and sisters. Okay, we're going to talk about the sinful nature. But I want to send you a picture first so that you may be able to see the difference between sin and sinful nature. Before I talk about the sinful nature, I want to give you a little bit of an example of what exactly is the sinful nature, right? Because our sins have been forgiven. So what are sins? Sins are outward behavior right? Such as looking down on others, such as never listening to others, seeking fame, putting your interests first all the time, you say things that are mean. So our sins, our behavior, they have been forgiven by the Lord Jesus. But the sinful nature, which is the root of why we sin, just like the picture I sent you a while ago, right? Why can't we enter the kingdom of heaven? Because we still have poisons right? The arrogance, the selfishness, the jealousy, the vanity, once again, the list goes on. All of this has not been removed by Jesus, brothers and sisters, all right? Hence why the Lord comes back for the work of judgment. So once again, what is sin and what is sinful nature? Well, sin is bad outer behavior, such as telling a lie, cursing, committing adultery, pursuing evil trends of the world. So brothers and sisters, when you sin, you know when someone is sinning, right? Because they're outer, outer behavior. When someone lies to you, you know they're lying. When someone's stealing, when someone's cursing, uh, when someone is uh, committing adultery, when people are pursuing evil trends of the world, you can see it. Those are all sins. Those are all outer behaviors that has already been forgiven. But the sinful nature is the will, is the will of bad behavior, brothers and sisters, which is hidden inside of your thought, inside of your mind, such as being greedy, being selfish, being jealous, being arrogant, lazy, stubborn, dishonest, hypocrite. Brothers and sisters, once again, the list goes on. So sinful nature and sin are different. Sin is bad behavior and sinful nature is the will of bad behavior. So our sins, the reasons why we commit sins, it's because of the sinful nature. It is the sinful nature, the things that you have hidden inside of your thought, inside of your mind, inside of your heart, that actually leads you to commit sin. 
So let me give you an analogy of a tree, brothers and sisters, okay? So that you may be able to understand it a little bit. Let me give you this analogy of a tree. For example, we all seen a tree before, right? Now think about it, brothers and sisters. The tree also has its cycle, the leaves, the branches, the grass, it has its cycle, life and death, right? So let's say for a second, um, you, you cut the grass, right? Let's say you cut the grass, my beloved brothers and sisters. You mow your lawn, you cut your grass, and all of a sudden, a week later, your grass is growing again. And you're like, man, I just cut my grass. Why does it keep growing? But my question to you is, why does your grass keep growing after you cut it? Do you know why? What do you think, brothers and sisters? Why does the grass grow after you cut it? Why do the leaves grow back after you pluck them out? The answer is in the picture itself. Are you able to grasp it, brothers and sisters? What's the answer? Why does the grass grow after you? Ah, there you go, Brother Ty. Very good sharing, my dear brother, because it still has roots, right? It's attached to the roots. Very good sharing, brother. So our sin is like the branches of a tree. It's like the leaves of a tree. You can see it, right? But the sinful nature is like the root of a tree, just like how Brother Ty shared. It's like the root. It's buried beneath the surface. You cannot see it. You really can't see when you go outside, you look at a tree, you can see the tree, but you can never see the root because it's deep in the soil, right? So nonetheless, brothers and sisters, the root, it is the root that causes the tree to grow. It is the root that causes the grass to grow, the leaves to grow, right? So it really does not matter how many times you remove the branches. It doesn't matter how many times you remove the leaves. Because as long as the root remains within the soil, the tree will always grow back. So it's like having our sins forgiven. As long as the sinful nature is not removed, sin will always sprout and grow more and more, brothers and sisters. Because remember, the sinful nature is within our thought, within our mind. Because I'm going to give you an example, right? Think about this. We have all lied before. We have all lied before. And why do you lie? Because lying is a sin. But now let's understand why. Because there's a sinful nature behind it, right? So the reason why you lie is because you're trying to cover up something that you did. Out of what? What is the sinful? What is the intention, which is the sinful nature? It's out of vanity or out of pride, right? Or why do you lie about another person? You lie about another person because lying is a sin. But why are you lying about that person? What is your intention for lying? Well, it's because maybe you're jealous of them or you envy them. Jealousy and envy are a sinful nature. Deception is also a sinful nature. So, brothers and sisters, you see, every time when people commit a sin, there's an intention behind it. And this intention is called the sinful nature. Because quite frankly, nobody goes around lying for no reason. So as long as we have the sinful nature, people will always go back to sinning again and again and again, right? It's like the Bible verses in, um, in Matthew and 1 John, where in Matthew, it says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And 1 John 3, 15, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murder has eternal life in him. Amen. So as you can see, brothers and sisters, these are all things that we have deep inside our hearts, right? God looks at the heart of men, things like lust, things like hate. So without undergoing God's judgment work in the last days, people cannot achieve holiness. We can't become worthy of facing God, right? Because we, we have the sinful nature. So let's have a look here, brothers and sisters. What does the Bible say, right? God clearly says, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. God wants us to be holy, my beloved brothers and sisters. And the fact that we still have the sinful nature, it means that we are not holy, all right? So let's read the spiritual words here together. And I believe um, Sister Angie 
Sister Angie wanted to read first, and then Sister Andrea wanted to read second. So Sister Angie, would you like to read uh, this passages of words here? It starts with changing man's disposition, starts with knowledge of his essence. Do you mind reading yes. for us? Yes, I'll, I'll read it, I'll read it. Thank you, thank you, sis. Okay, good evening, everyone. Changing man's disposition starts with knowledge on his essence and through changes in his thinking, nature, and mental outlook. Through fundamental changes, only in this way will true changes be achieved in the disposition of man. The root cause of corrupt dispositions arising in men is Satan's deception, corruption, and poison. Man has been bound and controlled by Satan, and he suffers the egregious what is harm that Satan has inflicted upon his thinking, morality, insight, and sense. It is precisely because the fundamental things of man have been corrupted by Satan and are utterly unlike how God originally created them, that man opposes God and cannot accept the truth. Thus, changes in man's disposition should begin with changes in his thinking, insight, and sense that will change his knowledge of God and his knowledge of the truth. Amen. Very good reading, Sister Angie. Very good reading. Amen. Thanks be to God. You see, brothers and sisters, we can all understand that 2,000 years ago, right? Yes, we were redeemed by the Lord Jesus. This is true. Our sins are forgiven, but it only completed half of the work of salvation. So God comes back to do greater work. It's on the foundation of the Lord Jesus' work of redemption. God returns to the flesh in the last days. It is to express the truth, brothers and sisters, to fully cleanse mankind with the work of judgment, to free us from Satan's forces, all right? Because I want to give you another picture as well, because the sinful nature is something that is inside of us, okay? For example, brothers and sisters, have a look at this picture, right? It's going to come to you very soon. Let's say you got bit by a snake. You got bit by a snake, right? And you go to the doctors and the doctors just puts a Band-Aid and he gives you some medication and he says, you're free to go home. Do you really think you're free to go home after just having a Band-Aid and some medication? What do you think? Are you really free to go home? No, right? Amen, Brother Ty. You're absolutely not. And why is that, Brother Ty? Why aren't you free to go home, Sister Angie, Sister Sheila, Brother Ty? Why can't you, why aren't you free to go home yet? What's the reason behind it? Well, because the poison is still in there, right? Exactly, Brother Ty. The venom is still in there. It, there's still toxins in your body. So the venom toxins in our body is like the sinful nature, the corruptions that we have embedded by Satan for generation to generation up until today. So in order for you to be okay to go home, the venom needs to go, needs to come out, right? The venom needs to come out of your body, brothers and sisters. It's just like us. In order for us to enter the kingdom of heaven, the sinful nature needs to be cleansed and needs to be gone. So only by accepting the work of judgment performed by the Son of Man in the last days can we enter the kingdom of heaven. So Brother Ty says you need an antidote, right? You need, you need an antidote. So our antidote, brothers and sisters, is the word of God. Our antidote is the truth that will be spoken by Christ of the last days. So without accepting the work of judgment in the last days, you're kind of just like stopping halfway on your path of following God because it is the last step that is the most crucial that will determine your fate and will determine our destiny. So not accepting God's work of judgment, brothers and sisters, you're, you're really wasting all your previous efforts because if people won't accept this, if people do not want to accept God's work of judgment, the cleansing, the antidote, like Brother Ty says, which is the word of God that he will bring in the last days, then you'll be eliminated by God. 
And in the end, it's going to be a tragedy. So we can be sure that no matter how, how long someone has been a believer, if you don't accept God's return in the flesh, yes, you will be eliminated and you will be a foolish virgin that will fall into the disasters of the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth. All right. So my beloved brothers and sisters, putting it all together, right? 2000 years ago. Yes, we were forgiven for our sins, but coming in the last days, right? The end time work of judgment is actually a purification of our sinful nature. And it is with God's words, with the truth. All right. Amen. Amen. So my beloved brothers and sisters, I do have a question to ask you guys. All right. After, but before I do ask you a question, are we clear on the difference between sin, outer behavior and sinful nature, the will? the intention to sinning? Are we clear about that, brothers and sisters? Because the sin has already been forgiven. It is now the sinful nature that needs to be cleansed. So that's why God comes back in the last days to resolve the sinful nature. All right. Amen. So let me go ahead and ask you all a question. Okay, brothers and sisters. My question is, why does God come to carry out the work of judgment? Why? Is it A, to forgive our sins again? Is it B, to purify our sinful nature so we can be fully gained by God, or C, judgment is not needed. Anyone that has faith in the Lord will go into the kingdom of heaven. What do you think, my beloved brothers and sisters? Ah, Sister Jessica says B. Lawrence also says B. Sheila says B. Ty says B. Anyone else? What do you think, brothers and sisters? Amen. Sarah, Nancy, Elizabeth, Rose says B. Julie also say B. Sh uh, Tammy says B. Shirley, Red Redrochris. I apologize if I am pronouncing, mispronouncing your guys' name, okay? Uh, Taylor. Uh, we also have Ted. Good sharing, brothers and sisters. Very good sharing. Thanks be to God. Yes, B is the correct answer. All right. The correct answer is B, brothers and sisters. It is to fully, it's to purify our sinful nature so that we can fully be gained by God. So through this work of judgment and chastisement, man will fully come to know the filthy and corrupt substance within him. And he will be able to completely change and become clean. Only in this way can man be worthy to return before the throne of God. All the work done this day is so that man can be made clean and be changed through judgment and chastisement by the word, as well as refinement, man can cast away his corruption and be made pure. Amen. Amen. So my beloved brothers and sisters, if we really want to have a full salvation, not only can, do you have to accept the work of redemption, but you also have to accept the work of judgment because they go hand in hand. You can't accept one without the other, right? So from this, we can see, brothers and sisters, why judgment really is important. It is the sanctification of our sinful nature, the roots that we have inside of us that still goes against God, resists God, betrays God. All that needs to be extirpated, all right? Meaning it needs to be gone, all right, brothers and sisters? It needs to be gone. Amen. Amen. Good job, everyone. Good job. So now we come to understand one, God comes back in the flesh for the work of judgment. And we also come to understand that judgment is actually a purification. It's a sanctification of the corruptions that we have inside of us, right? Because our sins is outer behavior, which we are forgiven. But the sinful nature is the corruption that we have inside of us, which makes us resist God and go against God, right? So now we're going to talk about how. How does God carry out the work of judgment? How does he cleanse us? How does he save humanity? What is the antidote that we need in order to be fully cleansed? Well, I've got the answer in Bible verses spoken by the Lord himself. And I believe Sister Andrea wanted to read. Sister Andrea, would you like to open up your mic and read here for us, Sister?
All righty. All right. How does God carry out the work of judgment to cleanse and save humanity? John 12, 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words, as that which judges him, the words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Psalm 96, 13. Before the Lord, for he cometh from, for he come to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharp, sharper than any double-headed sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart john 17 17 sanctify them through thy tr truth thy word is truth amen amen sister andrea don't leave just yet i have another uh passage here for you to read okay some spiritual words that you can read for us as well sister whenever you see it you can begin reading okay Christ of the last days uses a variety of truths to teach man, to expose the substance of man, and to this dissect the words and deeds of man. These words comprise various truths, such as man's duty, how man should obey God, how man should be loyal to God, how man ought to live out normal humanity, as well as the wisdom and the disposition of God, and so on. These words are all directed at the substance of man and his corrupt disposition. In particular, the words that expose how man spurn, spurns God are spoken in regards in regard to how man is man is an embodiment of satan and an enemy force against god in undertaking his work of judgment god does not simply make clear the nature of man with a few words he exposes deals with and prunes over the long term all these different methods of exposure, dealing and pruning cannot be substituted with ordinary words, but with the truth of which man is utterly bereft. Only methods such as these can be called judgment. Only through, through judgment of this kind can man be subdued and thoroughly convinced about God. And moreover, gain true knowledge of God. Amen. Amen. Very beautiful reading, Sister Andrea. Very beautiful reading. Amen, brothers and sisters. Thank so you. After, thank God. So after reading these um, passages of words here for us, I do have a question. Uh, what does God use to judge us, right? What does God use to judge us and to make us holy in the last days? Would you say A, fire, B, disasters, C, truth, or D, miracles? What do you think, brothers and sisters? What does God use to judge us, to make us holy, to cleanse us, to sanctify us? What has God always used? Amen, Sister Sheila. Amen, Sister Eve. Amen, Brother Ty. Anyone else? What do you think, brothers and sisters? Who else? Feel free to share. Feel free to share. What does God use? This is so important for us to know. As believers of God, we need to understand how God perfects mankind, right? Amen, Sister Julie. Any other brothers and sisters would like to share? Amen, Andrea. Amen, Angie. Shirley. Amen, Lawrence. Ted. Amen, Jessica. Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen, Van Steen. That's right. There we go. Amen, Sister Anna, Elizabeth, Sarah. Amen, Ronald, Tammy, Jeffrey. So I see one person said God uses disasters. 
actually no <laughs> god uses the truth brothers and sisters okay god uses the truth to cleanse mankind remember what the bible says you shall know the truth the truth shall set you free the bible also says sanctify them through your truth your word is truth right sanctify which means to purify sanctify them by the word of god okay so we can understand here brothers and sisters judgment is god expressing more words to cleanse and to purify our sinful nature it is written in the prophecy spoken by the lord jesus he who rejects me and does not receive my words will have one that judges him and also he shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth sanctify them through thy truth your word is true you see brothers and sisters so the lord will teach us many things that he didn't tell us in the bible from two thousand years ago for example do you really know how to obey god do you know how to practice obedience towards god in all things and everything at all times or even during the times of trials do you know how to obey god god also teaches us how to be loyal to him even when we're tempted with worldly and fleshly desires how can we remain loyal to god how can we live out a normal humanity right so god's work of judgment is god using words it is using words to expose and to resolve our sinful nature exposing our rebelliousness and our corruption that we fail to see for ourselves also resolving these corruptions by telling us of ways to practice using words to lead and to guide us so really brothers and sisters the work of judgment is a salvation for the believers who truly love the truth all right that's what it is amen amen so now that we know that god uses the truth brothers and sisters are we clear because we're going to talk about one more point before we're done are we clear in understanding that god uses the truth to cleanse us to make us holy right amen amen so brothers and sisters i'm pretty sure now you want to know right i'm going to ask you a question give me one second this is going to get good, brothers and sisters, because we're going to talk about where can we find the truth God will use in the last days, okay? So, since we know God will use the truth to judge and to purify mankind, then where can we find the truth God speaks in the last days? Do you think his new words, now let's think about a key word, new. Do you think you can find God's new words inside the Bible or outside the Bible? What do you think? If he has to come back, right? He has to come back to speak more truth. Do you think his new words will be in the Bible or outside the Bible? Now think very carefully, brothers and sisters, because the answer is not as difficult, okay? If God needs to come back, and, and you have to think about the Bible. The Bible is already written thousands of years ago so if the lord needs to come back to do new work speak new words where do you think you can find his new words then new keyword right <laughs> i see sister sheila says outside that's right lauren says outside ty says outside angie also says outside but i do some see some brothers and sisters who said inside but actually, it's outside. Brothers and sisters, think about it. The Lord needs to return as the Son of Man. He needs to speak new words to purify us and cleanse us, to make us holy. Of course, he's going to speak outside of what is already written. God doesn't come back to repeat what he already spoke 2,000 years ago. So do you want to know where we can find God's new words? Well, let's read, all right? Let's read some more prophecies, brothers and sisters. And I believe for this one, I can read, okay? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down step by step. But actually, I will have a brother or sister. Who would like to read this one? Revelation 5, 1 to 5. Would anyone like to volunteer to read this one here? We're going to find out where we can find God's new words. Okay, Sister Sheila, go right ahead, sister, whenever you're ready. Sister Sheila? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Was I not reading it? Did you not hear me? 
No, not at all. I just hear you now. So would you like to uh, begin from the beginning? <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, perfect. Thanks, sis. No problem. Revelation 5, 1 to 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat... on the throne of a book written within and on backs, the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angelic angel proclaim with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said to me, weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. Amen. Good reading, sister. Very good reading. Thanks be to God. So let's talk about this prophecy here, brothers and sisters, right? Because we all know the book of Revelation was written by Apostle John. Um, it was the vision God gave Apostle John to write the book of Revelation. And in his vision, take a look. He saw in the right hand of him that sits on a throne, a book. Let me ask you all a question. Who sits on the throne, brothers and sisters? Who is he that sits on the throne? Isn't it the Lord himself? Exactly, Brother Ty. It is God. So in the right hand of God, Apostle John seen a book. But this book was sealed with seven seals, meaning it was closed. So John could not open that book at that moment, which was like, what, thousands of years ago, right? But he started to cry. He's like, well, who's, who, who's worthy to open it, right? So he started to weep. But one of the angels or one of the elders said, weep not, like, don't cry. Because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, will prevail to open the book. So now ask yourselves, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? Who is the root of David? There you go, Brother Ty. It is Jesus. Brothers and sisters, it is Jesus who can open the book, right? So look at Revelation twenty two sixteen. It tells us who the lion of the tribe of Judah, who the root of David is. In Revelation twenty two sixteen, it says, I, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony to, for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Jesus is the offspring of David. He is the root of David. So meaning this book will be opened by the Lord Jesus, brothers and sisters. All right. So it'll be opened by the Lord. And we already know 2000 years ago, the Lord Jesus did not open a book. Did he now? No. Right. The Lord Jesus did not open a book 2000 years ago. He will only open a book in the last days, which actually brings me to the next prophecies, okay? So not only does this book is mentioned in the book of Revelation, but it's actually also mentioned in the book of Daniel. Let's have a look. And so when will Jesus open the book, right? Well, let's know. Daniel 12, 4, it says, but though, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And then we have Daniel 12, 9 to 10. And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many, focus on this part, because remember, we're talking about the judgment. And we know that judgment is a purification. So focus on this next part. When the book is open, it says, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked 
shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Brothers and sisters, these prophecies gives us so much clues, right? First and foremost, when will the Lord open up the sealed book? Clearly here it says in the time of the end, when the Lord comes back. That's why he comes back as the son of man to give us more truth. We all remember what the Lord Jesus said 2,000 years ago. I have yet many things to say to you, meaning he still has more truth he needs to give us. We're redeemed, but we're not perfected. So the words of perfection is in the sealed book that only Christ will be able to open and give it to us, right? And why does the Lord want to open the sealed book, right? Think about it, brothers and sisters, right? There is another book that will be opened in the end time when the Lord comes back. But why? Why does the Lord want to open up the sealed book? Well, let's take a look at the characteristics within this book. First and foremost, what does it say? Many shall run to and fro and knowledge. Knowledge shall be increased. So when the Lord comes back to open the sealed book, knowledge shall be increased. You're going to gain more truth, brothers and sisters. Not only the truth that you know about now, but you're going to gain more truth about God, truth about yourselves, truth about your corruptions, right? Which is awesome. So knowledge shall be increased. And uh, there's more. Why does the Lord Jesus want to open the this book in the last days? Not only that, but look, look what it says. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. Many shall be purified. So when the Lord comes in the last days to speak more words, many shall be purified. What is the work of judgment? The purification of our sinful nature. Look at that, brothers and sisters. It's right there in front of us. God comes back to speak more words, to open up a new book that can purify us, make us white, which means to make us holy. And also tried, meaning we will face various trials. The road to the kingdom is not as easy as we imagine, right? We will face many trials, temptations, but as long as you keep to the word of God, you will be perfected. But there's more. There's more, brothers and sisters. God clearly says, because remember, when God comes back in the last days as the Son of Man in the flesh to speak more words, not everyone's going to accept. Remember, not everyone's a believer. That's why the Lord Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's take a look here. The Lord says, the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. You see, wicked people, non-believers, they will not understand what is written in the sealed book. They will not understand God's new words because why? They're going to be so stuck with the old work that they don't want to accept the new. You see, brothers and sisters, that's what God says. The wicked shall do wickedly. Who cares? They won't understand, but the wise will. The, the wise virgins will, right? God's sheep will. That's why God's sheep hear God's voice. It's just like 2,000 years ago, right? 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus came to speak words outside of their Bible. Because 2,000 years ago, when the Lord Jesus was in the world of men, well, what happened? All they had was the scriptures, which was the Old Testament, we call it today. And when Jesus came, he spoke outside of the scriptures. He spoke his own words because God is everlasting, right? God is always going further and above and beyond of what is already written because he is God. He's the creator. God knows exactly what we need. So in the last days, God will come with more words. He's going to open up a new book. And when you really think about it, brothers and sisters, God has always spoken outside of what was already written, right? You have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament, and now you'll have the sealed book. All of these books are written in different times. The Old Testament was written for the time of Jehovah, right? For the work that he did, issuing the laws and commandments. And then we have the New Testament, which is the work that Jesus did, the redemption. But what about the judgment? Because the book of Revelation has prophecies of what will happen, but where is the book that we need? The sealed book. You see, brothers and sisters, God always has words for mankind. 
right? So God speaks new words to carry out the work of judgment. Amen. Brothers and sisters, does that make sense? Are we clear? Are we clear that God needs to speak more words outside of the Bible? Can you understand? And look, we read these prophecies, which were spoken by who? By God himself, right? In the book of Revelation, it was the vision that God gave John. And in the book of Daniel, this is a conversation between God and Daniel. You see, brothers and sisters, God already gave us the truth right in front of us, right in front of us. So now let me ask you guys a question. Where can we find God's new words in the last days? Where can we find God's new words in the last days? A, the Bible, B, the sealed book, or C, you still don't know. What do you think, brothers and sisters? Where can we find God's new words? Amen, Brother Lawrence. Amen, Sister Eve. Amen, Ty. Any other brothers and sisters would like to share? That's right. Amen, Sean. Amen, uh, Rose, uh, Sarah, Elizabeth. Uh, amen, Nancy, Tammy. Amen, R Rodricus. I hope I said that correctly. Amen, Sister Julie. Amen, Sister Sheila. Amen, Ted. Good job, brothers and sisters. What about Sister Hiata? Uh, Sister Nancy, Sister Kitty. What do you think? Sister Jessica, what do you think, sister? Feel free to share as well, okay, brothers and sisters? Don't be shy. We want to leave here with understanding the truth correctly, right? Amen, Louise. Uh, amen, Jaguar, Temple. Very good sharing. So, my beloved brothers and sisters, you're absolutely correct, all right? Where can we find God's new words? You can find God's new words in the sealed book. Because let me tell you, for the brothers and sisters, for the two brothers and sisters who said the Bible, how can you find God's new words in the Bible? Makes no sense. If the Lord comes back, how can his new words be recorded in the Bible in advance? That's like saying the Lord Jesus' work is in the Old Testament. No, it's not. Because when Jesus came into the world of men, he spoke new words. He went outside of what was already written at that time. And hence why the Lord Jesus was actually condemned and nailed to the cross. Because Jesus spoke words outside, right? Jesus spoke words outside of the scriptures of their Bible. And they said, no, you have come to deceive us. But the Lord didn't come to deceive us, brothers and sisters. He came us to fulfill the prophecies and give us the truth. It's the same thing. We have prophecies of the Lord coming back a second time. So he needs to fulfill the prophecies. In order to fulfill the prophecies, he needs to give us new words. All right. So from this, we can see, brothers and sisters, all of the truth that you will find in the sealed book, there are words to judge us, expose us, prune and deal with us, also to test us, refine us. So really God's words that judge and expose our corrupt essence will also reveal our disposition. It'll reveal our nature and our essence. God is going to reveal people for, for who they really are. He's going to expose all the sinful nature we have inside of us. So going through the work of judgment really is the only way to see the truth of our corruption. Because a lot of people don't understand their corruption. A lot of people think I'm a good person. I do good deeds. I have good behavior. I can enter the kingdom of heaven. Wait till the Lord comes back and gives you the truth, right? You'll be able to understand that, wow, yeah, I'm a good person, but I'm still kind of a jealous person. I'm still arrogant. I'm still a selfish person, right? So God is going to expose the corruptions in us, my beloved brothers and sisters. You may think that you're a good person, but what's on the inside? What is your true essence, right? Why do you keep resisting God? Why do you keep still disobeying God? You can be good for a week, but what about the next week? You go back to your original self, your original self right? So, so going through the work of judgment, brothers and sisters, is really the only way for us to know the truth of our own corruption so that we can start feeling regretful and know that we actually are unworthy of the kingdom of heaven, right? We're unworthy of seeing God. With the sinful nature, we can't enter the kingdom of heaven. God says, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. We're not holy yet. Only by being cleansed, only by being perfected by God can we become holy, right? So, my beloved brothers and sisters, those of us who will experience uh, God's judgment and cleansing, yes, we will be able to escape our sins. We will be able to be made pure by God. And only the truth expressed by God in the last days can cleanse our corruption and save us from sin. So really, 
only experiencing the judgment of God's words that can cleanse and change our corrupt disposition so that we can become those who do God's will, right? We're worthy of entering the kingdom of heaven. So God's work of the last days, which is the judgment work, is what actually brings us the way, the truth, and the life. It is through God's work that we can gain the truth, the life, and live before God, which is really a tremendous blessing for all of us. All right. So let me send you a picture here, brothers and sisters, just to show you a little bit that each and every single one of us, we're dirty. We're like this dirty cup of water. All right. Take a look at this picture. We're like a dirty cup of water, brothers and sisters. Look at the one up, all of us, because that dirty cup of water, that inside is dirt, right? Which is the sinful nature that we all have. So only by accepting the watering and the shepherding of God's words, can we slowly be cleansed? Can we slowly be purified, brothers and sisters? All right. So the more truth you receive, the more cleansed you can become. All right. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Does that make sense, my beloved brothers and sisters? Are we clear so far? Amen, Sister Eve. What about other brothers and sisters? Are we clear? Are we clear on this point? Amen. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, brothers and sisters. Thanks be to God. So as we are coming towards the end of our fellowship, I want to ask you another question, okay? Five minutes and we will be done, brothers and sisters. My question is, how can we enter the kingdom of heaven then? How can we enter God's kingdom? A, we can directly enter when God comes back since our sins are forgiven. There's no need to accept the judgment or B, we should accept the work of judgment and get rid of our sinful nature and live free from sin. Or C, as long as we keep praying and reading the Bible, then we can enter God's kingdom. Or D, I'm not sure. What do you think? Amen. <laughs> Carl says, B fits. B fits. Amen. Maria says, B. Jessica says, B. Lauren says, B. Eve says, B. Ty also says, B. Taylor says, B. Oh, give me one second. Uh, Rose, Nancy, Elizabeth, Taylor, Ronald, uh, Tammy, Sean, Jeffrey, Rhoda Chris says B, and Rakim also says B. Amen. Van Steen also says B. Anna also says B. That's right, brothers and sisters. You got to accept God's work of judgment. Without it, your sinful nature will never be cleansed. And if your sinful nature is not cleansed, you're the type of person that will always live through life sinning, confessing and then sinning again, then confessing again, then sinning again. It's going to be a cycle until your death. But if you can accept the Lord's return, you're in the process of purification. You're in the process of receiving the truth, the process of being perfected by God. So really, accepting God's end-time judgment, it is the process of purification to lead you to everlasting life, brothers and sisters. All right? Because there are many people who are obviously not true believers. There are people who say, God doesn't become flesh. Oh no, we can just wait for God to come on the cloud because the Bible says in Revelation 1, 7, behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him and also, also those who pierce him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. So there's a lot of people who will not accept God becoming flesh because of this one Bible prophecy. But yet they want to disregard all of the other prophecies that the Lord Jesus has already mentioned that he comes back as the son of man to do the work of judgment, to give us the truth and to open up the sealed book. What about those prophecies? Right? So if you want to become a stubborn and foolish person to only wait for the Lord to come on the cloud, go ahead. But passively waiting for the Lord to come on the cloud, you're waiting for your own punishment because this prophecy clearly says you will wail. Why are people going to wail? Because it's too late. It's too late. You have rejected the return of the Son of Man. You have rejected the judgment, the cleansing, the purification of God's new words. You have rejected everything that the Lord Jesus already told you. So the only way for you to do is to be punished. All right, brothers and sisters, is to be punished. So let's read some passages of God's words. All right, brothers and sisters, let's read a passage of our spiritual words together. 
some spiritual words together to try to understand what is the consequence, right? There's consequences for everything, right? Exactly, Sister Eve, their sins are too heavy. If you can't accept the judgment, your sins are too heavy. And the only way for you to do is because what are the wages of sin? The wages of sin are, is death. But the only way to get away from it is to accept the Lord's return, accepting the judgment. So let's go ahead and listen to this uh, passage of uh, spiritual words together to understand what is the consequence of not accepting. Let's listen. Christ of the last days brings life and brings the enduring and everlasting way of truth. This truth is the path through which man shall gain life and the only path by which man shall know God and be approved by God. If you do not seek the way of life provided by Christ of the last days, then you shall never gain the approval of Jesus and shall never be qualified to enter the gate of the kingdom of heaven. For you are both a puppet and prisoner of history. Those who are controlled by regulations, by letters, and shackled by history will never be able to gain life and will never be able to gain the perpetual way of life. That is because all they have is turbid water that has lain stagnant for thousands of years instead of the water of life that flows from the throne. Those who are not supplied with the water of life will forever remain corpses, playthings of Satan and sons of hell. How, then, can they behold God? If you only try to hold on to the past, only try to keep things as they are by standing still, and do not try to change the status quo and discard history, then will you not always be against God? The steps of God's work are vast and mighty, like surging waves and rolling thunders, yet you sit and passively await destruction, sticking to your folly and doing nothing. In this way, how can you be considered someone who follows the footsteps of the Lamb? How can you justify the God that you hold on to as a God who is always new and never old? And how can the words of your yellowed books carry you across into a new age how can they lead you to seek the steps of god's work and how can they take you up to heaven what you hold in your hands is the letters that can provide but temporary solace not the truths that are capable of giving life the scriptures you read are that which can only enrich your tongue not words of wisdom that can help you know human life, much less the ways that can lead you to perfection. Does this discrepancy not give you cause for reflection? Does it not allow you to understand the mysteries contained within? Are you capable of delivering yourself to heaven to meet God on your own? Without the coming of God, can you take yourself into heaven to enjoy family happiness with God? Are you still dreaming now? I suggest, then, that you stop dreaming and look at who is working now, at who is now carrying out the work of saving man during the last days. If you do not, you shall never gain the truth and shall never gain life. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Thanks be to God. So we can he see here, right? The consequences are very brief. If we cannot accept Christ of the last days, brothers and sisters, then how can we be approved by God? 
remember what the Lord Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. In order to get to the Father, you have to go through me, right? So the Son of Man comes twice. You can't just accept the first coming and not accept the second coming, right? Because we still need to accept the truth that can cleanse us, that can purify us, the new words that will be spoken by God when he comes back in the flesh, right? Because really, the only way that we can enter the kingdom of heaven is to be holy. So really, the judgment work is, is to make mankind holy, brothers and sisters. And if we can't accept that, then we are the most ridiculous people on earth, right? And in the end, God will see that our faith is not justified. So from tonight's fellowship, brothers and sisters, I have, after tonight's fellowship, I have three questions that we can answer before we end the topic here for tonight, okay? So the first one is, who is the judgment work for? Do you think it's A, for everyone? because we all have a sinful nature, or B, judgment is for the unbelievers. What do you think, brothers and sisters? Who is the work of judgment for? Everyone or just the unbelievers? Amen, Sister Eve. Amen, Brother Ty. It is absolutely for everyone. Yes, because all mankind have a sinful nature. Doesn't matter how long you've believed in God, we all do. Pastors, preachers, normal believers, right? Everyone has a sinful nature, brothers and sisters. So very good job. Very good job. Now, my second question. Well, what is the consequence of rejecting? What is the consequence of rejecting God's work of judgment? Is it A, to be eliminated by God and death? B, nothing. God will always forgive us until the end. Or C, I don't know. What do you think, brothers and sisters? What is the consequence of rejecting? Do you think, oh, no, God is always going to forgive? No, absolutely not, brothers and sisters. A is the correct answer. Amen, Lawrence, Ted, Eve, Sheila, Ty, Jessica. Absolutely. A is the correct answer. Why? Because, brothers and sisters, if you cannot be perfected by God, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven because judgment is the purification of our sinful nature. Yeah, God will forgive, but he won't forget, brothers and sisters, okay? Remember, being forgiven of our sin does not grant us entry into the kingdom of heaven. You also have to be perfected and purified of your sinful nature. Which brings me to my last question, which is based on everything we share here for tonight. No ABC, I want to see your own writing. So in your own words, why does God come to carry out the work of judgment? This is where I will see brothers and sisters answer. So feel free to share and type. Why does God come to carry out the work of judgment? We given um, we have given examples such as the tree, such as getting bitten by a snake, right? Amen, Brother Lawrence. Very good sharing. Anyone else? I'm not going to say the answers out loud of what brothers and sisters are saying just because I don't want brothers and sisters to copy from each other, but I want you guys to answer in your own understanding. What did you gain from tonight's fellowship? Why does God have to carry out the work of judgment? Let's all share, okay, brothers and sisters? Sister Jessica, Brother Ty, Sister Eve, feel free to share. Um, Sister Mary, feel free to share. Amen, Sister Sheila, good sharing. Uh, Sister Eve, hmm. You can try again, sister. Amen, sister Tammy. Good sharing. Amen, sister Julie. Good sharing. Mm, Brother Ted, sister Eve, you can try again. Brother Ty, good sharing. Um, sister Shirley, it's not because his word says so, but we, we need to understand the, the underlining work of why God needs to judge us, right? Amen, sister Rose. Good sharing. Amen, brother Ronald. Good sharing. Um, amen, Jeffrey, good sharing. Oh, Sister Jessica, very good sharing, sister. Very good sharing. Um, Sister Rich, Brother Richie, you can try again as well. Amen, Sister Nancy, very good sharing as well. So brothers and sisters, I will give you the answer, okay? But after the fellowship is done, I'm also going to leave a video behind. So for the brothers and sisters who may not got the, get the answer correct, I'm going to share you the answer, but I also want you to watch the video. But after the fellowship is done, brothers and sisters, 
after the fellowship is done, I will also give a call to the brothers and sisters who are here tonight. Sister Samantha will also do the same, okay? So the answer for tonight's, um, for the review is actually brothers and sisters. Why, why does God come back to judge us? It's to purify, to purify our sinful nature so that we can be fully gained by God. Remember those two words, purify and sinful nature. The judgment, brothers and sisters, it's not for God to test us. It's not for us to enter with pleasure. It's not none of that. It is a purification, all right? It is a purification of our sinful nature, just like the redemption was to forgive our sins, to redeem our sins. Judgment is to purify our sinful nature, the things that are inside of us, okay? So if your answer looked like anything like this, very good job. But for brothers and sisters who may not have the answer correctly, it's okay because we're going to continue to review some more, okay? Because brothers and sisters, the work of judgment that God will do in the last days is really, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a touchy subject, right? It's very, very deep. So if you have any questions along the way, please do not hesitate to ask. And like I mentioned, after the fellowship is done, we will definitely be able to, um, to do some review. All right. So brothers and sisters, I feel like we can end our fellowship here for tonight. But before we do go, of course, it's always important that we do a closing prayer. All right. So Sister Samantha, would you like to do the closing prayer for us tonight? Or any brother or sister would like to pray? Sister Sheila, Sister Andrea, or Sister Angie, would you like to pray for the group tonight before we go? Any volunteers? Brother Lawrence? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Father God, we just want to thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your speakers. Thank you, Lord, for this study. Lord, it helped to open up our hearts, our intellects, and to show us how to be ready for your coming. Lord, we thank you for all the organizers of this Bible study. Lord, we thank you that you're helping us to understand your will. Mighty God, as we're about to end this for tonight, we ask that you be with us and help us, dear Father, to live in such a way that we will be purified in your coming. Lord, these and other mercies we ask in your name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Very beautiful prayer, Sister Andrea. Thanks be to God. All right, brothers and sisters, thank you so much for your wonderful participation. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for your wonderful participation, your attendance, um, also your wonderful sharing here for tonight. Brothers and sisters, if you do have any questions regarding our topic, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or Sister Samantha or Sister Catherine. All right. We will be able to help you all. And like I mentioned, after the fellowship is done, which is now, I will be able to give you some call. Um, if you have any questions, any prayer requests, whatever uh, your heart desires, um, I'll be able to be there to, um, yeah, to answer your inqu inquiries. Okay, brothers and sisters. So thank you so much. And I hope you all have a wonderful night. And remember, tomorrow, we're going to continue. All right. Tomorrow, we're going to continue. We're going to learn how to hear the voice of God. What does it mean to hear the voice of God? The Lord says, my sheep hear my voice. So what does it mean to hear God's voice? You don't want to miss it. Okay, brothers and sisters, have a blessed night. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Bye, Sister Eve. Bye, uh, Sister Jessica. Good night, brothers and sisters. Uh, good night, Sister Andrea, Sister Jennifer. Uh, good night, Sister Sheila. Good night, Richie, Lawrence. Uh, good night, Julie, Dion, Paulette, Andrea, Kimbra, Sandra, Nita. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful night, okay? See you all tomorrow.